A couple of weeks ago, I did some videos on Andre Karpathy's CVPR21 talk. In it, I talked about how he's working with Tesla to train the AI for full self-driving. But from comments and conversations, I've come to realize there's a kind of confusion that a lot of people have between what it means to train a neural network and what it means to utilize a neural network. So that's what this video is about. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. So if you haven't watched the two Dr. Andre Karpathy videos from CVPR21, I'll put the links to them up here and also in the description. Before we get started on this topic, I wanted to touch on a couple of really, really cool things that have happened recently. Number one is just really briefly, Ross Gerber, who is a major analyst at Gerber Kawasaki, as his name implies, he's a major analyst there. He just recently tweeted out that the Tesla Model S Plaid is the quote, greatest car on earth. That's pretty impressive praise. Remember, this is a financial analyst and his tweets actually have you know an impact on the market so i'm sure he's a very careful person in terms of what he says online so that's a pretty remarkable statement of support for tesla now he's definitely a you know tesla bull and everything but that's a pretty remarkable statement i mean we're talking about you know bugattis and mclarens and other very very high-end cars he doesn't say you know the greatest like consumer level car or greatest production car or something he's like this is the greatest car on earth so that's a really really cool statement anyway just wanted to throw that out there for anyone who's interested that's very bullish for Tesla. And speaking of Twitter, I can't not talk about the fact that Elon Musk reposted in a tweet a Tencent PUBG promotional video using the Cybertruck and the Roadster in it. It's a pretty cool thing. It's for their PUBG game, which I think stands for Player Unknown Battleground. Uh, apparently they have over 1 billion downloads. It is a phone game, you know, mobile type of game, and it has a billion downloads, which is kind of like, right? <laughs> that's that's one out of every eight people. Amazingly enough, I don't have it. And weirdly enough, uh, people have talked about how this is a great promotional video for Tesla, and certainly it is. This is amazing stuff, right? The video itself, which I'll show some clips from while I'm talking about this, shows the Cybertruck and the Roadster in very, very... Um, glowing details. Tencent actually owns 5% of Tesla, so clearly there's a, a motivation for them to uh, say good things or show good things about Tesla. And they've done this before. They've had wraps and such in their games. But this one's particularly amazing. And what's interesting is that I actually think it kind of works both ways because I'm a big Tesla fan, but have never really played PUBG. But now I'm thinking about downloading that game. So actually, this could help out Tencent as well. I don't know how many downloads they would get, but it might get them, you know, a few hundred thousand and downloads, which is not a bad thing. So, you know, it kind of works both ways. This is a great promotional help for, for Tesla that didn't have to pay a penny for that. And it's also a great help for Tencent because probably it's going to lead to more downloads. Anyway, it's a really, really cool thing. It shows off the Cybertruck and the Roadster. The Cybertruck in particular, it's on Mars, you know, it's on Earth, it's got parachutes, it's a badass thing, it's wiping out robots. It's, it's a pretty cool promotional video, I have to say. So anyway, I just wanted to touch on that as well. That's very, very cool. And finally, a huge shout out to the folks at NASA and the Hubble Space Telescope team. Uh, what an amazing job. They got Hubble back online and working again. It had failed, um, I think, a month ago. I think it was June 13th, so a little over a month ago. Uh, it had failed and it had gone into safe mode. And, you know, this is ancient hardware. It was built in the 1980s, so it's almost 40 years old. They managed to resurrect it and get it back, and I believe it's working and collecting data again. So great job, guys. Till the James Webb comes online, that's what we've got as our eye in the sky. So fantastic work keeping it going. All right, so on to the main event. What does training versus deployment mean? Mean, right? So you probably have some vague idea of this, but we can get a lot more specific about this. So uh, what they call the training engine is the training engine. I think that's just what they call it. And what Dr. Karpathy talks a lot about is the inference engine. And that's kind of the, I don't know, trademarked name of what the, uh, what the deployment version is. So that's the hardware. If you own a Tesla, you've got this full self-driving three hardware board in your car. It's got dual redundant chips that the AI team helped co-developed and Tesla actually designed. And I believe it's Samsung that actually makes the chips right now. Anyway, so this is a really, really cool thing, but this is the deployment version of what Tesla is doing. So what does that mean? That means that what they care about in this particular design and this hardware is power savings and doing just enough, right? 
right? So I guess it would be thinking about something like a uh, cell phone versus your desktop, right? So your desktop, you plug it into the wall, and if it uses a couple of hundred watts of power between the computer itself and the monitor, no big deal. With a phone, it really, really matters, right? If you were using that kind of wattage, the phone battery would die instantly and you would have no usable life out of this thing. So that's the way to think about it, right? So the hardware that's in a Tesla itself, yes, it has, you know, a 75 or so kilowatt hour battery, but every single watt that you're pulling out and using for the full self-driving computer is watts that you can't use for pushing the car forward or reversing it or whatever, moving the car. So you obviously want to keep this thing at a minimum. And the entire board with both chips and all of the other, you know, extra stuff that's on it runs at around 100 watts, which is pretty darn impressive, right? So that's like if you go back to the old school light bulbs, that's an incandescent light bulb, the bright kind that was the 100 watt kind. So that's like running one of those off of the battery. It's not nothing by any means, but it's very, very, very low power compared to other things. And of course, the other piece of this is that these things run very, very fast and they run very energy efficiently, but they only have a certain amount of memory and they only have a certain amount of processing power. So anyway, that's the full self-driving hardware that's actually on your car. Now, how do they train it? I know if you haven't heard about Dojo, you can check out my videos on that, but they don't have Dojo up and running yet, but they do have the approximately fifth most powerful supercomputer on earth right now that they're already training on and it is a beast. So the training hardware itself is a different thing entirely, right? They don't care about power. In fact, I'm sure this thing is, you know, it's in a building and they probably have solar to help power it, but this thing is a beast and I don't even have, you know, we're talking megawatts of power to run this thing and to do the training. So you're, you're not caring about efficiency at all. You're caring about doing the training in an, well, you're not looking at power efficiency, right? You're looking at training efficiency. So we're looking at massively parallel, huge, huge numbers of CPUs and GPUs and communication equipment and, you know, multiple petabytes of storage, etc. So again, Dr. Carpathy talked about this in his talk. It is a huge, huge beast of a computer. And so what they're doing here with the hardware is they've got it all about how fast can you train another iteration of this software. They don't care about power efficiency. Efficiency. They don't care about deploying this mobily. So it's in a giant, you know, building and it's, <laughs> it takes a long time to install something like this. These are kind of one-off deals. So that's the hardware that's being used for training purposes. So that's the difference, right? The hardware that's being used to do the inference, the, the driving itself is very small, very lightweight, very low energy. The stuff that's being used to train all of this is very, very bulky. It's very, you know, room bulky, physically bulky. It's very heavy. It's incredibly power intensive. So those are two completely different things. So you've got your deployment or inference hardware and you've got your training hardware, two completely separate things. So now let's talk about software. I'm gonna start with the training software because I think it's gonna be easier to understand this. I guess one thing I should definitely note, if you don't take anything else away from this, there's a lot of people who have the misconception that if you're driving your Tesla, it's actually training your Tesla. It is not training your Tesla. The car is just doing its thing. It's using the deployment model that you've got. The thing that's doing the training is the training computer, right? So this giant beast of a thing that lives in a huge building and is using all these megawatts of power, that's what's actually doing the training. So what it does is it takes all of these billions of miles and of course a lot of this, a lot of it actually is just figuring out what to train on. So there's a whole separate subsection of the supercomputer that's just figuring out what data is important, right? So driving on the highway under normal circumstances, the car's got that down. You know, my non-beta version of the software works perfectly fine with that. So it doesn't really need an awful lot of cases of that. And as that turns out, that's probably 98 or 99% of all the data from the highway specifically, let's say. So what it does want is it wants all those little weird edge cases where something goes wrong, somebody breaks immediately, somebody, I don't know, there's a giant barrel out in the middle of the road, you know, random stuff that happens every once in a while that's like, you know, ah, right? So it's the kind of thing that you remember from driving where you're like, wow, that was really close or I actually got in an accident or something like that. Those are the moments that they actually care about. So a lot of the processing power is just sucking out those moments of data and of course a lot more on streets, right? So city streets where you have pedestrians and you have cyclists and you have, uh, you know, you have construction going on and you have red lights and stop signs and unprotected lefts and all sorts of random things. That stuff is very, very interesting to Tesla right now. So those are the kinds of things they're using a huge amount of processing power to pull that stuff out. Now, your inference engine on your car 
will actually pull those out. It has sort of flags that it notates as you're driving. So if you're not driving the beta software, if you're driving the regular software, you don't have a specific button. The beta software, they can actually push a button and say like something went wrong here. But the th kind of things that can happen is that the car itself, you can have it in full self-driving mode and take it out of full self-driving mode. That is a red flag, right? So if you're driving along and the car is gonna like run into something like a barrel in the road or something, it just doesn't see it and you grab the wheel and you turn it and you take it out of full self-driving mode, that will automatically flag and it will send that bit of data to Tesla's mothership. So anyway, so that actually helps, but they're also looking for other things. They're looking for mismatches between predictions and what that driver actually does. So there's lots and lots and lots of flags. And again, Dr. Carpathy has talked about this before. But so anyway, a huge amount of processing power is just figuring out what data is the good data to train on and what they need to fix right now. You know, what sort of issues are still there with their full self-driving package. So that's a whole bunch of processing that goes on. Doesn't happen in the car, happens on the mothership end, right? So in their supercomputer end. And then the other piece of this puzzle is they actually have to do the training, right? So they have to pull in all of these petabytes of data and they have to do training. They have to take their neural network model, which is really, really complicated. And again, this neural network is absolutely huge. It's, it's kind of like a multi-layer kind of thing where they have a head, a trunk, and then little nodes off the end of that. So it's a gigantic neural network. They have to train it on a ton of data so it requires this giant massively parallel massively powerful computer that can do all this um, the last I heard was it takes about 72 hours per run to do this. I don't know if that's true anymore because I think their computer is more powerful than it used to be. But anyway, it takes a long time, right? That's three full days. But anyway, even if it's half that time, it's still, you know, a day and a half. So it's a long, long period of time to do this training. And that's on this massively powerful, massively parallel computer. So it's doing this training on the training end of things. It goes through all of this stuff, right? It figures out what data is good to train on. It trains on that data and then they send it out to validation and the validation has to go through a bunch of simulations that's more processing power then of course they put it in the engineers cars and then it's more towards deployment just to make sure that it's actually working properly so all of this stuff is being done on the training end before you ever see it in your car as a consumer then what actually gets to your car well the first thing they have to do is they have to do what's called refactoring and I've heard about this a lot in code but I hadn't really ever heard of this in neural networks so it's kind of cool but they're able to do this what it means is they're basically you know, dumbing it down or simplifying it, right? So the, let's say they've got a gigantic model that takes like this much room. So, <laughs> right? so we're going to do like physical area. So it's taking up this much room, but all that can actually fit on the, the inference computer, the thing in your car is like this much room, right? So what they have to do is they have to take this big model and they shrink it down. Now, this is not a physical thing. Obviously, they're not talking about physically changing the size of it, but the model itself is, you know, this big if you're going to use that as an analogy. And what they have to do is squeeze it into a tiny space. So what they're doing is if you think about something like Photoshop, if you ever take Photoshop or an image editor or something and you shrink a big picture down to a small picture, it still looks like the same picture. So what you're doing is you're pulling the pixels out and you're reducing the number of pixels in between between and you're kind of blending them together. So that's more or less, I mean, yes, that's an analogy. It's not a perfect analogy, but that you can think about it that way. So they're taking a big picture, they're shrinking it down to a little picture. They're taking a big neural network and they're shrinking it down to a little one. It's not going to be as perfect as the original network, but it's good enough, right? Your driving doesn't require you to have millimeter accuracy. It really requires you to have like about half a meter accuracy. You, as long as you're like this far away from somebody else, and that's really, really close, right? So usually it's gonna be even further. It's gonna be closer to a meter away. So anyway, uh, you know, as long as you're in that realm, it's fine. So you don't have to have incredible precision. You just have to have good enough precision. So they can shrink this thing down and they can put it on your drivable computer. And so that's a lot of the ways that they reduce the power and all of that other stuff. And also remember, this is not a training uh, version of the software anymore. This is a deployment version. So there's a lot of stuff in the neural network like dropout layers and other things like that that they can get rid of in the process of deploying it. So they can reduce the size of this, they can reduce the energy requirements, and that's what goes into your driving computer. So training, you're doing all of this stuff, you're experimenting, you're running it through things, you're using a huge amount of processing power. And then deployment, it's just kind of a fixed thing. It's no longer creative, it's just doing the same thing over and over again. And then of course they take the data, it's a 
feedback loop. So as the driving computer, as the inference engine makes inferences and makes mistakes, that information is then sent back to the training computer, which then aggregates that into the next training run. And then it trains and trains and trains, and then it goes back to the deployment computer, and then it deploys it, and then it sees what mistakes are made, and then those are sent back to Tesla, and then it trains. And this is going on and on and on and on. By the CVPR21 talk, Dr. Carpathy said that their new vision only system had gone through seven iterations. And you know, you're like, wow, well, that's not that many. But you know, you think about how long it takes to do all this, there's the training, and then it's like, oops, that didn't work. And you have to train it again. Anybody who's done any of this kind of work before knows, you don't just like set it up and run it, and it works perfectly the first time. This is the kind of thing we have to do over and over and over again. So you have to do multiple training runs. And then when you think you've got something, you have to send it through simulations and quality control. And then it goes out to deployment to the consumer that's actually using it. So there's a lot of steps, it takes a lot of time. So seven iterations is actually quite a few. But anyway, so that's the basic difference, right? Hardware wise, you've got massive, massive amounts of power, massive amounts of computing power, massive amounts of electricity required, that's training. And on the deployment end, you care a lot about the power efficiency of it and the smallness, physical smallness of it and the good enough, right? It doesn't do everything, but it does what it needs to do good enough for it to work properly. In terms of the software, you've got experimental software that's very changeable. You've got things like dropout layers. You've got a whole bunch of other stuff in these neural networks that is alterable, and it's really, really big. The neural network models are huge. That's what's going on in training. You then refactor that and shrink it down and take out all the unnecessary stuff and put in just what you need, again, in the driving computer. So that's the hardware and software difference between training and deployment or training and inference. So hopefully that helps to explain to people who have been a little bit confused about that. Again, the big, you know, too long didn't watch takeaway from all of this is your car is not doing training. It is only collecting data and iterating on something that's already been established. Now, I do want to point out that there's some evidence that, and I don't know this for sure because Dr. Carpathy, as far as I know, has never talked about this, but I believe there's some memorization, like there's some memory stuff that can go on in terms of what the car is doing, right? So if you keep driving down the same street, like where you live or something, I think that it actually kind of learns that area. So it is able to memorize some stuff. So it's not completely static in the car, but it's mostly static. Like the neural network model and stuff is not changing, but what it can do is add some memory elements to it, I think. So I'm not sure about that. But anyway, that's about the most that can go on in your car. All the bulk of everything that's really going on, the interesting stuff and all the new training and all the new versions of the software and all of that kind of stuff, that's going on at Tesla's mothership. And it's using a ton of power and a ton of processing power. So anyway, I hope that kind of helps to explain what's going on with all of this. And for anyone who was confused, I hope that helps to alleviate some of the confusion. If you did enjoy this episode, please do like it so other people can find it. And of course, if you do enjoy this kind of content, please do consider subscribing. And for those of you interested in investing, check out Webull, an amazing platform for buying and selling stocks, and now cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Dogecoin, and others. Open an account and get a free stock valued at up to $200, and fund your account and get another free stock valued at up to $1,600. Check out the link in the description and help the channel at the same time. Thank you. And don't forget about our merch store, which now has physics is the law, everything else is a recommendation, which is a quote by Elon Musk, as well as other t-shirts, mugs, tumblers, etc, etc. Check it out in the description. As always, a huge shout out to my patrons on Patreon. Thank you all so much. I really do appreciate all of your help. It's been a wonderful summer, and I know I've been busy, but I have been paying attention to what's going on. And I enjoy the Discord conversations, and I definitely have a whole bunch of other videos that I'm thinking about from those conversations with my patrons on Patreon. So thank you again. And finally, don't forget we are both Tesla and Amazon affiliates. If you look in the description, you can see how shopping for a car or a solar roof or a battery pack or anything on Amazon helps out the channel. And as always, feel free to ask me questions in the comments or at my email address, which is drknowitallknows at gmail.com. Till next time, bye-bye.